Oh, hi. I'm the camera guy. Bob's taking some personal time and Man Cub's on vacation. Jason's been in the bathroom all morning doing God knows what. And I've been tasked to give you three videos a week. So here we sit. I'm going to teach you five ways not to weld stainless steel. What the hell steel. are you doing? You were in the bathroom all morning. I've been in a meeting. Oh, no, that's my chair. Let's go. <laughs> we got stuff to do. Hey guys, welcome back to Weld.com. Today we're going to do some TIG welding on stainless. We're going to show you five common mistakes and how to avoid them. All right, guys, so we got a couple weld samples here, different examples of good welds and bad welds. Um, we're going to get into some of the, uh, the basics here, try to help you guys avoid some of the most common mistakes, uh, teach you how to get your, your bad welds into some good welds. So before we do that, we're going to go ahead and check out the equipment. So today we're going to be using the new AHP Alpha TIG 201 XD. We're going to keep this very basic. Um, we're not going to run any pulse or anything fancy like that. We're going to keep it very simple, try to narrow down the amount of perimeters that we have. Uh, we're going to be running on DC negative, two-stage pedal, no pulse, about 100 amps. Um, they, they did take into consideration. They saw our last video uh, and they upgraded their foot pedal. So now each one of these machines is going to come with the, the Nova foot pedal. It also comes with this Rotoflex torch with a number 17 head and a replacement number 9 head. So you can use either one of the, uh, the heads on the same body. It's a pretty slick design, pretty comfortable in the hand. I haven't used one of these before. That's my first time using it. I'm pretty impressed with it. Uh, you have the ability to swivel and lock the torch into any in a number of positions um, to get comfortable. So comfort's always key, always be comfortable. Uh, I think this helps out a lot, be able to get in there and work on those welds. All right, so let's get started. So this first weld is an example of the proper technique. So with this, basically you wanna watch the size of your puddle. You wanna make sure that you're tying equally into the top edge of the plate as well as the bottom of the plate. The puddle should be shaped in almost a teardrop shaped form. If you're getting a C shape with a small hole in the middle, that means your torch angle isn't adequate. Okay, so adjust your torch angle and make sure that you're getting that teardrop shaped form. The leading edge of that teardrop is gonna be the penetration into the weld joint. That's where you really wanna focus your heat. The tip of the tungsten should be about 1 16th of an inch off the puddle. If it's too far back, it's gonna increase your voltage, thus increasing the width of your puddle. You don't want that. We want the weld size to be roughly the same height as that plate. So this is eighth inch plate. You want about an eighth inch leg on that fillet weld. So overall, this is a decent weld. I mean, you can see where it tied into the top edge really good. Didn't corrode too much of it away. We've got a good tie-in fusion to the to the uh, the bottom plate here, but as you look across and see the colors, you can notice that at, at the far left, you have that silver hue. That's kind of what you want. To the right, it's more of a straw color. Both of those would be acceptable as they're you know low oxides in there. You know a lot of people like the different colors and stuff like that, but essentially what they are is an indication of what temperature that base metal was at when it came in contact with oxygen. So if you look at this next weld, you see a lot of deep purples and blues and, and stuff like that. That's kind of what you want to avoid unless you're doing artwork where you want those colors to stand out and pop. Dabs Wellington on Instagram, he does an amazing job and he can predict exactly what color he wants to appear and, and where at, you know, just by travel speed and heat input and how fast he's moving through that joint to get the desired color. One additional thing you could do is if you, you know, if you're trying to stray away from those colors is use a gas lens and a larger cup size. So, you know, you get into like number 12 cups, things like that. It, uh, it tends to have better shielding, better cooling properties, keeps the weld shielded longer as you're moving through the, the weld joint, you know, providing more shielding gas to the weld, you know, so that it, once it interacts with that oxygen, it's at a much lower temperature. So you don't get those oxide layers built up on it. All right, so now that we've discussed what to do, let's take a look at some examples of what not to do. Our first common mistake is removing the filler metal from the shielding gas envelope underneath the cup. Okay, so for two reasons, you want to keep the electrode as close to the arc as possible. Okay, reason number one is every time that you remove the filler metal from that shielding envelope, you're contaminating the tip of the electrode and you're putting oxides into the base metal. You may not be able to see it visually while you're welding, but once it's done you'll notice you, you've got a lot more oxides on the surface of that weld, so you want to prevent that. The second reason is because when you keep that 
the tip of the electrode up close enough to that arc, it's preheating it so you get a nice smooth transition into the puddle. Okay, so a lot of times if you pull the, the rod back and forth out of that shielding envelope away from that arc, you're going to notice that electrode has a tendency to stick to the plate. Okay, so keep it in there tight, keep it close to the arc, and it's going to preheat it for you so that it'll, it'll absorb into that puddle a lot easier. Alright, so, so as you can see, the weld's pretty much the same profile. It's a little bit shallower because, you know, when you're pulling that rod out, you're not keeping your puddle consistent. So the puddle's going to lack consistency, plus you're going to have scaly deposits on top of the, the weld. You want to try to avoid that, so it's best just to keep that electrode nice and tight to the arc. Keep it, you know, right on the leading edge of that puddle, under the shielding gas envelope, you know, so it stays contaminant-free. Our second common mistake is moving down the joint or running excessive amperage. Both are going to give you the same results. So you'll notice in this one, I'm traveling too slow. So what that's doing, that's giving me a much, much wider puddle than I actually need for this joint. It's completely eroding the top edge of that plate, which is, I don't want to do that. I want to keep the weld roughly the same height as I do as that vertical leg of the fillet. So too much heat into this, I'm going to get sugaring and oxide layers on the surface of my weld. And I'm going to make that weld too wide and not get enough penetration into the joint. It's going to be more along the top edge of that plate. It's something you want to avoid. Too slow, take 17. <laughs> Alright, so as you can see here, the weld, number one, it's too wide. Uh, number two, I have excessive oxides on there. I mean, the, the weld's just smoked. It's gray. Doesn't even look appealing. Uh, I burnt up all the chromium and nickel that's on the surface of that weld. That's going to give me uh, my corrosive properties or anti-corrosive properties. Going to keep the material protected from different oxides once it's exposed to the elements. So you don't want to do that. So just maintain a good, consistent travel speed. Watch the wetting into the toes. Try not to erode that top edge. And as long as that puddle's moving forward and you got a good beat height, just just roll with it. And that's traveling too slow. Now it's Ferd Friday. Baby. We got an awesome fur sample pack to give away. All you have to do is post in the comments your most common TIG mistake. We got an encapsulated wire wheel, got a hard rock, zerk wheel, cutoff wheel. I don't even know what this thing is, but it eats steel like a mother. We got a flapper wheel and a badass beard brush, also used on steel. And now back to the video. Our third common mistake is moving down the joint too fast. Now this is probably the most common mistake that I see when people are learning how to TIG weld. The first thing you want to do when you light up on that piece of material is establish your puddle between the material and the electrode of your tungsten before adding any filler metal. A lot of times people add the filler metal before the puddle is even established. So I tell people that that, that initial puddle, the autogenous weld between the plates, that's like your master card. Okay? You don't want to leave home without it. So if you start welding and adding filler metal before prior to getting that puddle established, you're going to get a high ropey bead profile, you're, you're not going to tie into the plates equally, you're going to get poor penetration, things just aren't going to go well for you. And you know you can also see that along the joint you're not tying in properly. So get that puddle established in the very beginning and just push it along that joint. Alright so with this one everything that could go wrong went wrong. I mean you got to wait, you really have to wait for that puddle. Once you put your hood down, your whole life revolves around that puddle. Um, you just kind of got to nurture it along the way. I mean, this one is uh, way too fast. Slow down a little bit. I mean, I, I know you're going to be welding pretty quick on stainless, but you can't get overzealous and leave the puddle behind. You start leaving the puddle behind, there goes your weld. So the next common problem is that as you're working your way along the joint, you know, you're stable, everything's going good, you're getting a little rhythm, you're getting a groove, and all of a sudden either your, your hand that's holding the torch gets caught up, or your, your uh, hand putting the filler metal in gets a little overzealous and you contaminate. Ah, shit. As you can see, the arc just, the characteristics of that arc just completely changed. I now have a much wider arc in there. It's very unstable, it's hard to control. Things just aren't going well. As soon as you contaminate, you want to stop. You don't want to try and push through that and make it work. Okay, you're just going to make things worse on yourself. It's going to be more difficult, and the welds is going to look like crap when you're done. One of the things I recommend to a lot of people is sharpen both sides of the tungsten. So when something like this does happen, you can just flip the tungsten over. You get a quick change, uh, and then you know you only have to go out to the uh, the grinder stand half the time. 
All right, so in the beginning, you can see as we were going down the joint, everything was running smooth. Nice tight arc length, everything's going good. Good wetting of the toes, everything's washing in. Right along, minding our own business, and then bam, out of nowhere, that tungsten gets contaminated. And you, you could see exactly the transition right there, how erratic that arc became. It's really difficult to control the puddle at that point. You're not going to get consistent results. It sucks. I've been there, you know, I still contaminate myself every once in a while. You have to convince yourself, stop, resharpen the tungsten, dress it back up, or flip it around, and then restart. I mean, you're just going to run into, you know, you're not going to get consistent results welding with a contaminated tungsten, regardless of how small it is. Plus, you know, if you burn that tip off in there, if you're doing any qualification testing or anything that's going to get x-rayed, the tip of that electrode, you know, if you break it off in your puddle uh, due to contamination, that thing's going to, it's going to shine as soon as they put it in the x-ray machine. So... Just get in the habit of, if you contaminate, sharpen that tungsten back up, and then get back to work. Don't force it. Okay, now we're going to talk about torch angles. So you notice when I start this up, I get the puddle going, everything's going nice and easy, and the travel angle is completely wrong. I'm pointing straight into the, into the joint, 90 degrees. The puddle's not flowing near as well as it should be, probably getting too much penetration to the back side, which can cause sugaring on the back side of the plate because all my heat is focused down through that joint. Okay, this doesn't do well on very thin materials. You wanna angle that, give it a good five to 10 degree push angle. Okay, now we're gonna look and see what happens when you have too much of an angle. So now we're pushing more along the lines of a 45. So that means I'm not getting adequate coverage. You'll see that the arc length, as I rotate my hand back, the arc length starts to get a little bit longer. Now when that happens, it's going to be harder to deposit that filler metal at the leading edge. The tungsten or the filler metal is going to want to ball up and just drip into the puddle. That's not what you want. You want to keep that or that filler metal right at the leading edge of the joint. Keep it preheated. Watch that travel angle, and it should flow off nice and smooth for you. So neither one of these situations are ideal. One we have, you know, straight in, punching 90 degrees down. Uh, we're not, you know, it just doesn't give you a consistent puddle there. Same thing with, you know, having it too steep. Neither one of these are appropriate. Make sure you maintain that 5 to 10 degree travel angle and keep your filler metal 90 degrees perpendicular to your tungsten. That way you can ensure you're going to get a good bead profile, good weld aesthetics, and good penetration throughout the full joint. All right, guys, well, thanks for watching. I hope you were able to learn something today. I also want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Weld Metals Online. Um, for providing all the coupons and stuff for us, go ahead and check them out, weldmetalsonline.com. Get you some coupons, practice at the house. Uh, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comment section. Make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And until next time, make every weld better than your last. Hey folks, welcome back to another segment of helpmeweld.com. So today's submission is from Tanner Clark and he's on the Facebook group. He's running some 332nd 7018 at school. It's his second day. Want some tips on body position or any tips at all? Uh, he's finding it hard to get comfortable, which is going to cause him to be very inconsistent. He says, thanks. Well, Tanner, today's your lucky day. Let's go on back to the table, and I will show you uh, a couple little tricks that I picked up along the way and, and some stuff that I told uh, my students to help them get more comfortable and get better with their welding. So essentially what you want is three points of contact. Okay, that's going to make you more stable. So two feet on the floor, and what I typically do is I plant an elbow. If I plant my elbow right here, here's my base metal. Plant your elbow, take your fingertips, touch that to the tip of your knuckles here. Just very slightly, ever so slightly. You don't want to hold like this, because when that rod starts to shorten up, you're going to get, get into a bind, and you can't get your electrode holder down close enough to your material. But if, if that happens, all you have to do is just make a fist, and then you can go one-handed. So, and that's as this rod gets shorter. So basically post up, plant your elbow on the table, put your hip up against the table. That's four points of contact now. Strike the arc and as you weld, let this hand slowly lower you down. This hand, all it has to do is maintain that angle. Okay, as you touch in the material, you strike and then you just start moving down. Okay, and these two, these hands will start working together and then you develop a muscle memory. You can do the same thing when you get into uh, a 1G or a groove weld or a 1F doing fillet welds. Uh, same practice when you get into 2F fillet welds, horizontal. You can go this way, you just come in at that 45 degree angle to the plate. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, drop any additional questions in the comment of your original post 
and we'll be more than happy to help you out from there, man. Take care. Good luck. Oh, hi there. I'm the camera guy. Bob's taking some personal time and Man Cub's on vacation. Jason's been in the bathroom all morning taking his <laughs> uh, We're going to show you how to get your bad welds into uh, better welds. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm the camera guy. No, it's Third Friday, bitches. you know what that means. Maybe you don't. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means. I'm trying to work here, damn it. You can't smirk. You can't smirk because I've seen it under the little, little thing here. This little shit and grin you got going on. It's not working. <laughs>